This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri, Los Angeles, California, August 2006. The Consolation of Philosophy by Anicius Manlius Severinus Boethius. Translated by H. R. James. Book Two The Vanity of Fortune. Section 7, and Song 7, Glory May Not Last. Then said I, Thou knowest thyself that ambition for worldly success hath but little swayed me, yet I have desired opportunity for action, lest virtue, in default of exercise, should languish away. Then she, This is that last infirmity which is able to allure minds which, though of noble quality, have not yet been moulded to any exquisite refinement by the perfecting of the virtues, I mean the love of glory, and fame for high services rendered to the common will. And yet consider with me how poor and insubstantial a thing this glory is. The whole of the earth's globe, as thou hast learnt from the demonstration of astronomy, compared with the expanse of heaven, is found no bigger than a point, that is to say, if measured by the vastness of heaven's sphere, it is held to occupy absolutely no space at all. Now of this so insignificant portion of the universe, it is about a fourth part, as Ptolemy's proofs have taught us, which is inhabited by living creatures known to us. If from this fourth part you take away in thought all that is usurped by seas and marshes, or lies a vast waste of waterless desert, barely is an exceeding narrow area left for human habitation, you, then, who are shut in and prisoned in this merest fraction of a point space, do ye take thought for the blazoning of your fame, for the spreading abroad of your renown? Why, what amplitude or magnificence has glory when confined to such narrow and petty limits? Besides, the straitened bounds of this scant dwelling-place are inhabited by the many nations differing widely in speech, in usages, in mode of life— to many of these, from the difficulty of travel, from diversities of speech, from want of commercial intercourse, the fame not only of individual men, but even of cities, is unable to reach. Why, in Cicero's day, as he himself somewhere points out, the fame of the Roman Republic had not yet crossed the Caucasus, and yet by that time her name had grown formidable to the Parthians and other nations of those parts. Seest thou then how narrow, how confined is the glory ye take pains to spread abroad and extend? Can the fame of a single Roman penetrate where the glory of the Roman name fails to pass? Moreover, the customs and institutions of different races agree not together, so that what is deemed praiseworthy in one country is thought punishable in another. Wherefore, if any one love the applause of fame, it shall not profit him to publish his name among many peoples. Then each must be content to have the range of his glory limited to his own people. The splendid immortality of fame must be confined within the bounds of a single race. Once more, how many of high renown in their own times have been lost in oblivion for want of a record? Indeed, of what avail are written records even, which, with their authors, are overtaken by the dimness of age after a somewhat longer time? But ye, when ye think on future fame, fancy it an immortality that ye are begetting for yourselves— why, if thou scannest the infinite spaces of eternity, what room hast thou left for rejoicing in the durability of thy name? Verily, if a single moment's space be compared with ten thousand years, it has a certain relative duration, however little, since each period is definite. But this same number of years, ay, and a number many times as great, cannot even be compared with endless duration." For, indeed, finite periods may in a sort be compared one with another, but a finite and an infinite never. So it comes to pass that fame, though it extend to ever so wide a space of years, if it be compared to never-lessening eternity, seems not short-lived merely, but altogether nothing. But as for you, you know not how to act aright, unless it be to court the popular breeze, and win the empty applause of the multitude. Nay, you abandon the superlative worth of conscience and virtue, and ask a recompense from the poor words of others. Let me tell thee how wittily one did mock the shallowness of this sort of arrogance. A certain man assailed one who had put on the name of philosopher as a cloak to pride and vainglory, not for the practice of real virtue, and added— now shall I know, if thou art a philosopher, if thou bearest reproaches calmly and patiently. The other, for a while, affected to be patient, and having endured to be abused, cried out derisively, Now do you see that I am a philosopher? 
the other with biting sarcasm retorted i should have hadst thou held thy peace moreover what concern have choice spirits for it is of such men we speak men who seek glory by virtue what concern i say have these with fame after the dissolution of the body in death's last hour for if men die wholly which our reasonings forbid us to believe there is no such thing as glory at all since he to whom the glory is sent to belong is altogether non-existent but if the mind conscious of its own rectitude is released from its earthly prison and seeks heaven in free flight doth it not despise all earthly things when it rejoices in its deliverance from earthly bonds and enters upon the joys of heaven song seven glory may not last o let him who pants for glory's guerdon deeming glory all in all look and see how wide the heaven expandeth earth's enclosing bounds how small shame it is if your proud swelling glory may not fill this narrow room why then strive so vainly o you proud ones to escape your mortal doom though your name to distant regions bruited over the earth be widely spread though full a many lofty sounding title on your house its lustre shed death at all this pomp and glory spurneth when his hour draweth nigh shrouds alike the exalted and the humble levels lowest and most high where now are the bones of stanch Fabricius, Brutus, Cato, where are they? Lingering fame, with a few graven letters, doth their empty name display. But to know the great dead is not given from a gilded name alone. Nay, ye almost lie forgotten, tis not you that fame makes known. Fondly do you deem life's little hour lengthened by fame's mortal breath. There waits but you, when this too is taken, at the last, a second death. End of Book 2 The Vanity of Fortune, Section 7 And Song 7 Glory May Not Last